starting. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Croyden. I'm from the University School of the Low Country. We're here today um, sharing one of these uh, programs that came out of spring break, which is um, um, working with uh, people in the area and the Convention Center and Visitor Bureau to uh, let us see during these crazy times all the interesting people and interesting programs and attractions that um, exist in our city and see what people are up to and let them uh, tell you themselves and then maybe have a few moments at the end to have um, have questions and stuff. And so we have Abby today, who's part of the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, the TURTLE program. And uh, we're excited. She uh, got into a master's program that's going to start this fall at Florida Atlantic. But she's going to share with you this morning some insights um, into this important program here on coastal South Carolina. And we're glad you're all here. This is being recorded. Um, you're muted for now. Abby's got it. And so at the end, when questions come, I'll work on unmuting you. And um, Abby, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, hopefully everyone is staying safe and healthy. I really appreciate you guys having me today. So I have a PowerPoint presentation I'll be sharing with you. So I'll pull that up for you guys now so you can see it. Um, so I'll be talking to you guys about a few different things like sea turtles we have here in South Carolina, a little bit about them, what we do here at DNR, and then also expand it into sea turtles around the world and give you guys some cool information about different species of turtles and um, some other research that's going on. Uh, there's lots of pictures and videos. I'm hoping that the videos will play smoothly for you guys. If there's like any lag, there might be a little bit of lag, but if it's really bad, please let me know and I'll just be sure to describe more in detail of what's happening. Um, fingers crossed that they work and the internet connection isn't too slow. So first, a little bit about me, myself. Um, oops. So I'm a graduate from Coastal Carolina University, which is up in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I have a degree in marine science in minors in biology and psychology. This is now my fourth season working as a sea turtle technician. I've worked in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and Costa Rica with turtles. As I mentioned currently, I work for South Carolina DNR out of their Charleston office. And in the fall, I'll be attending Florida Atlantic University to pursue my master's with a focus on sea turtle research. And these are just some photos of me out in the field. And if your guys' little pop-up menu covers um, any of the pictures, you can just minimize that it might make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. Um, so there are seven species of turtles in the world. Um, those are the loggerhead, green, leatherback, Kemp's Ridley, olive Ridley, hawksbill, and flatback. In parentheses is their scientific name. And I also have listed the category they fall into according to the IUCN Red List. And these categories are just a way to kind of describe how close to extinction each of the species are. So you can see the image at the bottom, the closer the categories are to the right where it says extinct, the more likely it is that their populations are not doing well and they have the possibility of becoming extinct in the future. So here in South Carolina, we have these four species, the loggerhead, green, leatherback, and kemps. And as you can see, they're all listed as somewhere ranging between vulnerable and critically endangered. So the loggerhead is the most common species we have nesting here in South Carolina. So if you're ever on the beach and see a sea turtle nest, it most likely will be a loggerhead. They have really big skulls, so they have powerful jaws, and they are able to eat mollusks and crustaceans, so they're e able to just easily cut through their hard outer shells in order to get their meals. And these turtles grow to about an average of three to four feet and are about are 250 pounds or more, so they're pretty big animals. And the two photos, the one on the left is a hatchling of a loggerhead that was just born and had emerged out of the nest. And on the right is a nesting mother that is crawling back to the ocean, just to give you an idea what the species look like, look like at some different stages. And next we have the green, and they also will occasionally nest in Florida, but it's more common for them to nest further south. So Florida gets a lot of them in other places around the world, um, like in South America and the Caribbean. Uh, they're mainly herbivores, so they eat a lot of seagrass. They also can eat the occasional jellyfish and some other organisms too. And they're larger than the loggerheads. They'll grow to about an average of four to five feet, and they can get to be about 350 pounds or more. 
And again, some more photos so you guys can see what they look like. Uh, there's a hatchling on the left, a juvenile in the middle, so not fully grown yet. And then on the right is a nesting mother on the beach. Next up is the leatherback. They also only occasionally nest in South Carolina and are more common further south, like in Florida and Costa Rica, places like that. They primarily just eat jellyfish, and these are the largest of the turtle species. They can grow to be about six feet long, which is really big for a turtle, and they can be about 800 pounds or more. There's been some reported at almost 2,000 pounds, so these organisms can get really big. And again, a picture of a hatchling on the top and a leatherback on, or a nesting adult leatherback on the bottom. And finally, the Kemp's Ridley is the most rare to nest here in South Carolina, but sometimes we do get them. And they mostly nest though in the Gulf of Mexico. In the United States, it's mostly in Texas. And they mostly eat crabs, but they can also eat smaller bivalves, fish, and jellyfish. And these are the smallest of the seven species. They only grow to be about two feet and 80 pounds. And once again, you guys can see the picture of the hatchling on the left and the adult nesting mother on the right. So now I'll talk to you a little bit about the life history of a turtle. So this is just a quick diagram to show you guys a general overview of the life cycle. So the turtles start out as eggs and then they hatch into what we call hatchlings. Then they grow bigger into juveniles and finally they mature into adults. And then once they nest, the cycle starts over again. So now I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of these stages of life. So start out as eggs. <laughs> so on the left is a picture of a loggerhead nest up close. You can see the eggs are about the size of a ping pong ball. Uh, this can vary a little bit between species like the chems, the smaller turtles, their eggs are a little bit smaller. Um, but most interesting, I think, are the leatherback eggs, which you can see on the right. And they have a wide variety of egg sizes in each of their nests. So the biggest egg all the way on the left is about the size of a tennis ball. So they have really big eggs. And those are the viable eggs that produce hatchlings. Now all of the other eggs um, on the other side, all the way down to the smallest one, which is about the size of a blueberry or what we call spacer eggs. So these will not produce hatchlings, but they are included in the nest to help with airflow and help the hatchlings better develop that are in those larger eggs. And these eggs will incubate for about 60 days on the beach until the hatchlings are ready to emerge. So they all hatch out together at nighttime. So this is a video of a hatchling coming out. Hopefully you guys can see it okay. Um, like I said, they usually emerge at night, but sometimes the stragglers will come out in the morning. So this is just one loggerhead hatchling that I happened to catch emerging on one of my morning surveys. So you can see him slowly crawling out. <laughs> Sometimes it takes them a little bit because when they all come out together, they kind of help each other to all push out at once. So when they're stragglers, it takes them a bit longer, but as you can see, he successfully made it out. And then once they've crawled out of the nest, they all crawl to the water together. So this is a whole bunch of loggerhead hatchlings crawling. So as you can see, there are a lot of turtles. Each nest has about 100 eggs. It's a, it kind of varies based on the species. Loggerheads will have around 120. So once again, they usually hatch at night. This just so happened to be during the day, which happens on occasion. So as I said, those are loggerheads. Now this here is a video of a green hatchling. You can see it's very similar to the loggerhead in the way it crawls. Um, this one was just a straggler <laughs> crawling down the beach. And they usually crawl pretty quickly. They can make it usually from the nest to the water in like less than five minutes. And then finally an example of a leatherback. So these hatchlings are bigger as you saw from the larger eggs and they crawl with both their front flippers at the same time, which is different than the other species that you saw that had an alternate crawl, which is just kind of a cool difference between some of the species. So once they reach the water, they will swim out to large amounts of sargassum, which is seaweed that floats at the top of the water. So this is a video of a leatherback hatchling swimming out to sea. Um, they will swim for about three to five days straight to get to these sargassum patches that float at the surface. So 
They're out in the open ocean and this seaweed helps to protect them from predators since they are so small. So many things want to eat them and they stay there until they get a little bit bigger just using the seaweed as protection. There's also lots of small little organisms they can eat to grow bigger. So once they're a little bit bigger in a juvenile, they'll spend time mostly foraging at different um, foraging grounds and just growing bigger. So here is a juvenile green. You can see there's lots of algae on these rocks that it can feed on if it wants to. Um, it takes them a long time to mature. So they can be in the juvenile stage until they're 15 to 30 years old and they finally become adults. Um, and these foraging grounds also are along the coast. So they will transfer like from the large sargassum patches in the open ocean, come more towards the coast to grow bigger in these uh, foraging grounds. So then once they finally grow big enough to be considered an adult, they'll alternate between foraging grounds and nesting areas. So these are two adults currently in a foraging ground. You can see all the nice algae around them. And this is an example of some of the crazy migrations that these turtles will make to get between their nesting and foraging grounds. Um, these are leatherback tracks. So all the different lines are individual turtles that they've put satellite trackers on in order to see where they're going from. So you can see they've gone from the United States over to Africa and South America. So they definitely can cover a lot of ground between these areas. And they will come to nest on average every two to three years. And the females will crawl up on the beach at night to nest. Now this video can be kind of difficult <laughs> to orient for a second. Um, push play. So this is an up close of a loggerhead nesting at night. So you can see her flipper move up and down and in a second, you should be able to see into the egg chamber and you'll see a few eggs um, that she's laying as well, fall down into the chamber. Now you can notice that this video has a red tint to it and that's because white light is very disturbing to turtles. So anytime we work with them at night, we'll use a red light because it doesn't bother them as much because we don't want to disturb them while they're nesting. Uh, so red lights allow us to work and do research while still letting the turtle continue in her natural habitat. Um, and then once the eggs are laid, they will cover the nest with sand as well as camouflage it. So this here is a leatherback on the beach and you can see she'll use her back and front flippers to cover the nest. And this camouflaging helps protect the eggs from different predators that may wanna eat them. So this turtle I saw in the morning. So usually again, they nest at night, but sometimes it takes them so long that they're still on the beach in the morning. So this individual has probably been on the beach for about an hour or so. So you can see she's very tired. And in a second, you'll be able to see just how powerful they are and how much sand they can throw with their front flippers. They also take a lot of deep breaths because they're used to being in the ocean and on land, they feel much heavier. And then another example of camouflaging, this still happens to be a green turtle, just so you can see the difference in size a little bit better and just see that the nest and sand that she's thrown is a little bit smaller. Uh, this is a video I took down in Florida. We would see greens nesting in the morning all the time <laughs> because greens take a really long time to nest and they've actually been known to fall asleep in their body pits. So sometimes we'll pass by them and they'll be asleep and kind of us um, passing by on an ATV sometimes wakes them up a little bit which is kind of a good thing. It helps them move along with their process. <laughs> and then once like, she's done camouflaging, she'll crawl back to the water. So this is a loggerhead crawling back. Um, and then once the eggs incubate for 60 days, they'll hatch and the whole process starts again. Also mothers will nest multiple times a season. So this loggerhead will probably be back in about two to three weeks to nest again. So this map here shows different nesting beaches um, in North America. So you can see here in South Carolina, with that green dot, it indicates we get about 1,000 to 10,000 nests every year, which is a good amount of sea turtle nests. Uh, but down in Florida, they get about 10,000 to 100,000 nests, so a lot more turtles nest down there. They also can nest as far north as Virginia, but as you can see, they don't get nearly as many nests there also in Texas, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, you can look at those numbers. Again, this is only for loggerheads. 
um, to just give you guys a second to look at it. It's kind of a cool graphic just to see the different nesting amounts in different locations. So now I'll talk about some threats to turtles. So crabs are a pretty big threat. Um, I'm sure if you go to the beach, you'll see ghost crabs running around everywhere. They will eat both the sea turtle hatchlings and the eggs. So they can dig into the nest to get to the eggs. And then when the hatchlings are crawling down to the water, they'll jump out and try to grab the hatchlings as well. Birds are another problem. They won't so much dig into the nest, but when they see all the hatchlings coming out, they will swoop by and try to grab them if possible. Um, this is part of the reason why they try to emerge at nighttime, hatchlings do, to try to avoid birds and other predators. Coyotes, this is a video of a coyote digging into a loggerhead nest. Um, and once the coyotes realize that there's turtle nests in the area, they will keep coming back. They're very persistent to try to get more eggs. Raccoons and armadillos do a similar thing when they're digging into the nest. This here is a loggerhead nest that has been dug into. You can see the big hole that it has created, the eggs scattered around, and how the screen has been ripped off to the side. Uh, so once you realize you have a coyote problem, you really kind of need to keep on top of your nest to try to prevent as much predation as possible. Here's another image of a similar situation. Uh, unfortunately, you can see this nest probably was about to hatch. So you can see that there's hatchlings everywhere and eggs everywhere too. Hogs are another issue. We do have them in South Carolina. Uh, I know in Georgia, they're more of a problem, but you can see that's a pretty heavy duty cage that someone put on top of the nest to try to keep predators out. And the hog has bended the wires just to dig right underneath in order to get to the eggs. Another issue they face on land is storms. So each one of those staked off areas with the orange flagging tape is a sea turtle nest. And this is with a hurricane coming. You can see how high the tide is and that the waves are washing over almost every single nest on the beach. Now this is an issue when too much water gets into the nest because the eggs will basically drown because they won't get enough air and then that nest will no longer hatch. So some threats to turtles when they're in the ocean. When they're smaller and they're still hatchlings, large fish will eat them. Pretty much anything that's bigger than them will try to eat them. Um, but as they grow larger, sharks are pretty much their only main predator. You can see these two turtles here have been bitten by sharks. Um, the one on the right especially, you can see kind of that semicircle shape. So if you ever see a sea turtle that has a chunk of its carapace missing in a similar fashion to that. You'll know it's from a shark attack. Sometimes they can recover. We'll see turtles out and about that are missing a limb or a chunk of their shell and they're still doing perfectly fine. Um, so they can recover from it, but sometimes it is fatal. Now time to talk about human threats. So as you can see, this was is much longer than the other two lists and I don't even have them all listed here. These are just the main threats that we see. So plastic is a really big issue. Um, we see balloons like this picture all of the time on our beach surveys. We pick up as many balloons as we can, um, but the balloons will blow into the water and when they're floating around they look a lot like jellyfish, which is what a lot of the turtles will eat. And so then the turtles will end up ingesting the plastic which can cause a lot of issues. Sometimes there's trash on the beach, um, happens more than you would want to. So this here is a picture of people that came out on the beach probably the night before, all had a get together and left all of their cans in the sand, all of their beach furniture. So now when either a nesting mother comes up or attachments are trying to crawl down to the water, they're going to have to crawl through all this trash, possibly get stuck in the beach furniture, um, and it could trap them, which is not good. Another example of trash is a lot of times trash will wash up on the beach as well. So the previous picture was people that have left trash on the beach, and this image is all trash that has washed up. And once again, it'll block the sea turtles from nesting. Pollution is another major issue that turtles face. 
So storm runoff can be kind of a big deal if there's a lot of nutrients that are added to the ocean. Um, all of this pollution can make turtles really sick. Boat strikes. Um, so a lot of times boaters will be driving along and if they're not careful and looking for turtles, they can hit them. Turtles do breathe air, so they have to come to the surface every once in a while. And if a turtle pops up and someone's driving a boat and not looking, it's really easy to just hit them. So this photo here, you can see the turtle has a big crack in its shell and that's where a boat propeller hit it. Uh, this turtle was, is currently in like a rehabilitation facility and hopefully will recover from it though. So sea turtle bycatch is an issue when um, people are fishing, trying to catch fish, but sometimes turtles accidentally get caught. So these people aren't trying to purposely catch the turtles. It just kind of happens. So the top left photo is a whole bunch of shrimp trawlers, which shrimp is really popular here in South Carolina. Um, but sometimes the turtles will get stuck in the net and when they get stuck, they'll drown. Um, so you can see that picture. On the top right is a loggerhead that was stuck in a net. Um, there are measures put into place that's called a turtle excluder device that shrimp boats are required to have now, which helps the turtles be able to escape these nets, um, which has really helped decrease the bycatch problem, but it still does happen. In the bottom, you can see a turtle that has died and has a fish hook in its mouth. So even sometimes just catching the turtle with the fishing line also can lead to major issues as too. And along with that, just fishing gear that's discarded or accidentally um, dropped overboard can cause problems as well. So this here is a picture of fishing line that was washed up on the beach. So turtles can become entangled in this. It can wrap around their flippers. It can wrap around their neck and can lead to injuries or death. So people really need to be more careful about not losing their fishing gear. Next is lighting on the beach. Um, so especially with hatchlings, when they come out of the nest, they will crawl to the brightest light source that they can see, which usually is the ocean. If there's no other lights around, the ocean will be the brightest source, so they'll know exactly where to go and crawl right down to the water. But let's say a hatchling emerges and this is the lighting behind them at this hotel, but this is now the brightest source that they see. And instead of crawling to the ocean, they'll turn around and crawl right towards these artificial lights. Um, which is a big issue because they will never make it to the ocean. Beach armoring is another big problem, especially for nesting turtles. So you can see here, these people are probably preparing for a storm. So they're putting out sandbags, they put out this fencing. This is to prevent the waves from um, washing into their homes and different infrastructure. However, it's taking away the nesting habitat of these turtles. Another example, this one's a little bit more extreme before I start the video. I'll tell you a little bit what to look for. So up towards the vegetation, you'll be able to see um, some yellow stakes that orange flag can tape again. That's a turtle nest and it's in a pretty good spot. Those eggs should be able to develop perfectly fine. And then um, as we continue, you'll see how far this seawall comes out to protect some people's homes um, <laughs> in this video. I'm on an ATV and those uh, yellow things in the front are the stakes that we used to mark the nest, just so you know what that is. So as I'm driving along, you can see up there, there's the nest in a good spot. And then you can see how far the seawall comes down towards the ocean. So it just keeps going really far out. And then you can see just how long it is. So all of this is turtle habitat that was taken away. So these turtles will come up to nest they'll hit the seawall and instead of being able to nest, they'll just crawl back into the ocean. They'll have to try again later because their habitat was removed. Holes left on the beach are another really big problem. So it's great, families wanna go on the beach, have a good time. Sometimes people wanna dig holes. That's perfectly fine, but if they don't fill them back in, sea turtles can become trapped in these holes. So they'll fall in and not be able to get back out. So you can see here it's a loggerhead that came up to nest, fell into this hole, and now it's trapped. So that's a little bit about sea turtles South Carolina in general. And now I'll talk to you guys about what we do here uh, at DNR.
So as far as nesting goes, is we conduct beach surveys to record all new sea turtle activity. So we have volunteer groups that help us out, and also us employees will go out and monitor the beaches of South Carolina. So we record all new turtle crawls from the night before, as well as taking the GPS locations. So you can see the image on the left is a turtle crawl. You can see she just kind of came in and then walked right back out. So this is what we call a false crawl. So she came up to nest and for whatever reason, decided that it was not the right condition. This can happen for a number of reasons. It can be maybe she saw a predator and got scared. Maybe just the sand was too dry. She didn't like that part of the beach. Uh, there's human activity. Sometimes that can spook them as well. And then you can compare that to the picture on the right, which is a loggerhead nest. So you can still see her crawls in and out, but in the front, you can see all of that burned sand. And so that indicates to us that she did lay her eggs and we will mark that as a nest. So if we do find a nest that's in an area of high predation, which a lot of our beaches are, we have a lot of coyote problems around here. Um, we'll put a cage over the nest to try to protect it and keep the coyotes and raccoons from digging into the eggs. You can see the two different pictures of some cages that we'll place around. This does not affect the hatchlings whatsoever. We make sure we're really careful to not dig into where the eggs are when we're burying them. And when the hatchlings are ready to emerge, those spaces in the cage are big enough that they can crawl out no problem whatsoever. Uh, you can also see the picture on the left. We put stakes on all of our nests and that's just so we can find them later. We also will take a genetic sample from each of our nests. And this is for a project that's happening out of the University of Georgia with Dr. Brian Chamblin. So this picture here is how we collect our genetic samples, which is just an eggshell from each of our nests. And we label them um, with what nest they're from and what beach. And this is a really cool project that's going on. So from these samples, they can um, extract the DNA and determine what individual turtle nested there. And with this information, they can um, make maps like this one. So this is one individual turtle that they have seen that she has nested at all these locations over the last nine years. So you can see that she's nested all the way from Myrtle Beach down to almost Hilton Head. Um, and some of the nests are closer together. Turtles will generally nest close to the area that they were born in, which is also really cool. So give you guys a second to look at all the different places she's nested. And again, we have so many individuals in this database. Um, so you guys can look at that later on our website. So then once we see that the nest has hatched, which the way we can tell that is you can see that picture on the left is a big hole in the middle of the cage. And all of those little tracks down are hatchling tracks. So we can tell that the nest has emerged, all the hatchlings came out. Um, but we do give them three days after they hatch before we will dig into them. And this is because we want to let as many hatchlings come out naturally as possible before we're kind of messing with the nest. So after about three days, usually all the hatchlings have emerged by then. So then we'll dig into the nest and we can see how successful the nest was. So we'll count how many eggshells there are, which that indicates that the hatchling hatched properly and left. How many unhatched eggs there are, which is just an egg that didn't develop for whatever reason. And if we do see any hatchlings that are trapped and still alive, we'll release them into the water as well, which is always super fun when we get to do that. And then you can see those other two pictures are some people conducting inventory. So you can see they're digging them up and kind of putting them into categories to count the different eggs. So that's pretty much all we do for nests. Um, now to transition into stranding. So a stranding is just a sick or injured turtle that has washed up onto the beach. We get turtles that wash in both alive and dead. Uh, so you can see the picture on the left is a live loggerhead that washed in. The picture in the center, sometimes all we get is just the sea turtle shell, but that's still important information for us. And every strand we get, we'll take a whole bunch of photos, we'll report all the measurements and document any injuries that we see. We also check for tags, which you can see that picture on the right is just like a little metal tag with a number on it. And that's 
way we can identify the turtles. Some different groups will tag them for different reasons. Um, and so we record all of that. And if the turtle is alive, we will help to coordinate transportation to a rehabilitation facility. Um, this way you can get all of the medical assistance that it needs. Here in South Carolina, we usually will take them to the South Carolina Aquarium and they do an awesome job there of rehabilitating these sick and injured turtles. So all these pictures are turtles that were found as strands, were successfully rehabilitated and are being released back into the wild, which is always an awesome day. You can see how many people show up for these turtle releases, it's just so exciting. So you can see we have a couple of loggerheads and also a leatherback turtle that is successfully being released back into the wild. So another section of DNR says in-water surveys for turtles as well. This is not our section, so we personally don't do this, but I figured I'd mention it anyways because DNR um, still takes part in it. So what they do is they survey for turtles in the water each summer, so they'll conduct um, crawls and catch turtles to get a better idea of what the population is like off the coast. And they also take measurements of every turtle they catch, check for tags if a turtle does not have a tag, they're one of the groups that will put new tags on the turtle and record that. And they also will take blood samples. So this picture here is a juvenile temp that they caught in one of their trawls. So this is one of their slides from one of the presentations they do just to give you guys a better idea of the kind of information they get. So they look for the relative abundance of turtles, which is just how many turtles are in the area. Distribution patterns, so where these turtles are located, where they're catching them. Demographic structure, how many adults they're catching, how many juveniles they're catching, and what species. Then they'll also take the blood samples to do health assessment. So they'll send this off to different labs to get an idea of how healthy the populations of these turtles are. Over the years, they have caught five of the seven species of turtle. So the numbers of how many caught are listed in yellow. So they've caught about 2,500 loggerheads over the years, 389 Kent Ridleys, 21 Greens, two Leatherbacks, and one Olive Ridley. So as I mentioned, Olive Ridleys are not one of the turtles you see here commonly in South Carolina. So I know they were very excited when they caught that, which is kind of unusual to have in the area. So that's pretty much for turtles here in South Carolina. Um, just to give you guys a broader scope, I'll talk a little bit about turtles around the world, some cool things they do in research. So one of the newest phenomenons, in my opinion, is done by Kemp's and Olive Ridley sea turtles, and that's called Arabata nesting. And they will come up and nest with hundreds or thousands of them all on the beach at one time. So you can see in this picture, there are so many turtles. So they'll come up and all nest together. And they do this to try to prevent predators, one, while they're nesting, and two, to protect their hatchlings. So since they're all nesting at the same time, all their nests should hatch around the same time. Um, so that's a lot of hatchlings coming out at once. So hopefully they can avoid predators all coming out together. Next is the flatback sea turtle, which is only found in Australia, which I think is crazy. They have such a limited geographic range. So you can see there on the map, they're only found in that really small area. Um, if you remember back from one of my first slides where I listed all the species and their category uh, for how endangered they are, they're listed as data deficient. They don't have enough information yet to determine how well the population is doing, and that's just because they're in such a limited area and really people don't know too much about them yet. There also is currently a debate over a possible new species of sea turtle, which is called the black sea turtle, and they live in the Pacific Ocean. So right now they're characterized, or most people will characterize them, as a subspecies of the green sea turtle. So in this picture, on the left, you can see the more brown turtle is just the juvenile green. And then on the right, the much darker turtle is the juvenile black turtle. So you can see they do look different. Um, so they're still deciding if they're different enough to be considered a new species or not. 
the Hoxo sea turtle has a beautiful shell. They're found mostly in the Caribbean and warm waters. They are actually poached because their shells are so beautiful. So you can see the picture on the right, those bracelets are made from Hawksbill turtle shells, um, which is illegal to do. There's programs in place that are trying to shut this down, prevent the production of these products and sale of these products. Um, it's still an issue though, but it's declining. So hopefully as you move into the future, this will no longer be an issue. As well as poaching the turtles, egg poaching is an, another problem. This doesn't really happen here in the United States. It's more in Central and South America and some other places around Africa. But people will dig into the nest to collect the eggs to sell and eat. Um, they're considered a delicacy some places and they're highly sought after in some communities. There are more programs now put in place to try to track the poachers and to stop this behavior as well. So some recent research that's going on in the scientific community. Out of the United States, a study was just published that I think is super cool and interesting is they now have a way to tell if a turtle is male or female just based on using their blood. They've only really tested this in hatchlings. I'm not sure how well it plays out with older individuals. Um, but it used to be that you could only tell if a turtle is male or female when they were adults. So males have longer tails than females, or if you had a dead individual, you could look at their internal organs, but being able to tell their sex based on blood is a really awesome new discovery. In Peru, they have kind of an issue with catching turtles in the fishery. They're thinking like, okay, how can we try to stop this problem? So they had the idea if they put LED lights on their nets, if maybe the turtles would be able to see them better and could avoid the nets. And they tested this out and in their experiment, this did reduce the number of turtles they caught by 70%. <laughs> so that's a really big number. Hopefully they enforce that in their different fisheries and that way they can save a lot of turtle lives. They also do this in other places around the world too. This was just the most recent study that I found. As I mentioned, West Africa also has a turtle poaching problem for both the turtle meat and eggs. Uh, so they're trying now to figure out ways to stop this. So this study just was gathering consumer information, going to the people, talking to the communities, figuring out why they're buying turtle meat, why it's important to them to try to put a stop to this and then um, enforce different uh, measurements that can stop this activity. And finally, <laughs> people around the world wanted to see how many turtles have ingested plastic? So they conducted this study in all the ocean basins that turtles were found. They were able to catch every single turtle species in their study. And every single individual they caught was found with plastic in its digestive system. So this shows you just how big this um, ocean plastic problem is, is that every single turtle they caught had ingested some plastic. So that shows you how widespread this issue is. So now some ways that you guys can help turtles. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of these before, but limit your single use plastic. I know Charleston is doing an awesome job at trying to ban plastic bags at grocery stores, stop using plastic straws, which is super exciting. Hopefully more places start doing this. So when you guys go out to the store, just bring your own bag. It's not too difficult. Just one in your car or like by your door where you can really grab it. Also just use a reusable water bottle instead of using one of those single use plastic bottles. Recycle, recycle any plastic, paper, metals you have, it really does make a difference. Reduce your carbon footprint. If you're somewhere you can walk instead of drive, choose to walk there, bike there, drive together with people if you're all going to the same area. Participate in beach cleanups, whether it's an organized one with a different uh, like environmental group, or if you're just on the beach, walking around, pick up trash, even just around your own neighborhood or anytime you go outside and see trash on the ground, just pick it up. It can help it prevent being washed into our oceans. So when any holes on the beach, like I said, it can be really fun to dig holes on the beach and go for it. Dig as many holes as you want. Just whenever you leave, make sure you fill them up. If you see a turtle or turtle nest on the beach, 
don't disturb it. Just leave it alone. It's what's best. I know if you do ever see a turtle on the beach, it's super, super exciting. They're beautiful creatures. Just make sure you give them enough space so you don't disturb their natural nesting cycle. Don't use white lights on the beach. You saw in that video I was using a red light. Um, the white lights are really disturbing to the turtles, can cause them to crawl in the wrong direction. So it's best to not use any lights if you're on the beach at night, but if you have to, a red light is okay to use. And finally, just tell other people how they can help you. If you see someone that maybe is doing something wrong, just tell them or you know, tell your friends and family different ways they can help too. Finally, if you watched this talk or already had an interest in sea turtles or something related and you want to pursue a career in this field, these are just some personal tips for me that I would recommend. Just volunteering with a local environmental group or aquarium, just getting as much experience you, as you can. You can learn some really cool stuff from these places. If you can't go volunteer somewhere, just send them outside. Learn about different species of animals and plants. Learn as much as you can. This information really does come in handy um, in the future. Take any opportunities that allow you to grow your skill set, even if it's something that you might think, like, I'm not going to waste my time learning how to do this. I'll never need it. You never know what can come in handy when you're looking for a job. So just the more skills you have, the better, in my opinion. Apply to different internships. Um, to gain experience and don't be discouraged if people tell you no. I have applied to so many different internships and jobs. I've gotten some of them, haven't gotten others. Just be determined, people will eventually tell you yes if you're really passionate about it. And finally, just work hard. Like I said, it'll pay off in the long run. Um, careers, especially in turtles and other things outdoors, they, it's hard work, but I think it's super rewarding. And with that, I'll take any questions you have. Sorry, Abby, I've got everyone muted. So, um, okay. no so worries. I can hear. I can stop. <laughs> yeah. So then, um, as they if they put their hands up, then we'll unmute them. That way, we avoid any background and stuff like yep, that. Yep. That sounds. Got a question for Abby? Please raise your hand. And we'll unmute you. Liam, Liam, you got one. How did you get into like what made you want to be interested in turtles? Yeah, I've kind of always been interested in the ocean ever since I was little. I just would watch like ocean documentaries and just love them. Um, and then probably when I was in about high school, I really got an interest in turtles. They're just such unique creatures. And they're really cool because you can study them both in the ocean and on land. Um, and I just think that they're so neat. And I did an internship um, in Georgia, just the summer, I just decided to try it out. Like, I love the ocean. I think they're beautiful. And once I did it one summer, I was hooked. I absolutely loved it and just continued to pursue different jobs in that field. Uh, Jack Wheeler. Uh, do you think this coronavirus would be benefiting the turtles in any way? Because people wouldn't be going out disturbing them in uh, beaches or anything, I guess? They'd yeah, um, where I worked last year in Florida has been posting stuff on their Facebook that the turtles are doing awesome. They have so many sea turtle nests. I'm not entirely sure if they have less false crawls or not. It'd be really interesting to look into, but I know turtle nesting numbers right now are higher than they were last year. Turtle numbers, like nesting numbers, fluctuate between years anyways, so I'm not going to say it definitely is because of people not being out on the beach, but definitely is positive. I know there's been a lot less trash on the beach lately, a lot, a lot less holes, so there's definitely a less human threats that are affecting them right now. Abby, are y'all doing okay with volunteers to look out for the predators since there aren't people normally letting y'all know and all that stuff? 
Yeah, so nesting season here in South Carolina doesn't really start until next month. We haven't had any reports of turtle crawls or anything um, like that. So it'll be interesting to see transitioning into May what things look like and what the regulations are then. Um, as of right now, we're just kind of working on older projects and trying to get our volunteers prepared so that when the beaches do open back up, we'll be ready to go. You guys can physically raise your hand or use that participant button so it raises up if you're not running a video. Cadence, you got a question? Um, you mentioned Olio that hurricanes can be like a threat. Is there anything you can do to help protect them from that? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. What, that what is a threat? Uh, like storms and hurricanes. Storms, yeah. Um, there's not really too much. We can do here in South Carolina, if a nest is laid below the high tide line, we will move it just so that it doesn't get continually inundated with water. Um, but we kind of just let nature run its course when it comes to storms. So like I said, turtles nest multiple times a season and each of their nests has about 100 eggs or so. So they kind of almost prepare themselves, prepare themselves from storms in a certain way just by putting so many eggs on the beach, so many hatchlings. So they have a good amount. So even though last year when I was down in Florida, we got hit really hard by the hurricane, we still had a good turtle season because so many of the nests had hatched before that storm had hit. Um, it just will reduce their number slightly for that season. But overall, the turtles can kind of handle themselves with storms as, as long as they're not too crazy. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yes, I love questions. Please ask me questions. <laughs> I always love talking about turtles. <laughs> Sarah, I got my eyes on you because I know you want to you wanna do this someday. Do you have a question while we have Abby here? Yes. Um, if you had to choose like the best opportunity like from a place, like where would it be? Uh, it depends. So I would just recommend if you're trying to volunteer or get an internship somewhere, honestly, I would just apply to as many as possible. I remember when I was first starting, I guess, my junior year of college is when I started really doing internships. I think I applied to probably like 15 or so. Like I just sent my name out there in hopes that one would take me. I ended up getting one in Georgia. And then from there, I've kind of tried to work some different places just to work with different species. Like here, the loggerheads are great. When I was down in Florida, I was also working with green and leatherback nests. So definitely trying to get as many different um, kinds of opportunities as possible is what I would recommend. Work with as many species as you can in different places if that's an option. Um, but really anything helps. Um, just getting out there, getting involved, and the more things you can do, the better. I personally really like it here. I think the people here are awesome. I also really enjoyed where I was in Georgia and Florida, so I haven't really had a bad experience yet. So I would just recommend anything, <laughs> honestly. I uh, see Grady had a question. Um, so I, my last school was um, Sullivan Zion Elementary School. So we were going out on the beach a lot, and um, um, in third grade, I remember we saw a sea turtle that was coming back from the ocean, and she was going on land, and then she just randomly turned around and went away. I was wondering if maybe our presence could have caused that. Uh, it kind of depends if... Turtles usually will get spooked if you're standing like right in front of them or if you're making a lot of noise. If you're kind of being quiet and staying off to one side or the other, it really shouldn't affect them too much. Um, like I said, they're used to there being predators out on the beach, so they're kind of usually on high alert, but only if it's like directly in front of them. I would, still would not recommend approaching a turtle. But if you guys weren't really close and were kind of off to one side or the other, I don't think that you would have affected her that much. Hey, uh, Gertie? Um, 
Um, what is the average amount of eggs that actually um, hatch when a turtle lays them? Yeah, that's a great question. It is so variable. I would say just from my personal experience, I would say maybe about 70% of eggs usually make it, but it's really variable between nests. I have dug up some nests to inventory them. 100% success rate, they've hatched other nests if they've been washed over by the tides or predator got into it, seen all of the eggs lost. So it's super variable, but every season um, enough eggs hatch to still keep the population going strong. Grady, did you have another question? Um, no. Okay, I your just... hand was up. Gotcha. Oh. Oh, Jack Wheeler, here we go. Uh, do you think South Carolina would be the um, best location or state to get educated or I guess a job in this field? Uh, it depends. So I'm actually originally from Maryland. So all of my, all the way through high school, I grew up in Maryland and then came here uh, to Coastal to pursue my degree in marine science. So I would say it kind of depends on your school. You guys' school seems kind of different than where I went up and you seem to do a lot of like outside learning and stuff like that, which is awesome. So schools like that definitely help you gain experience that can be helpful in the future. Um, my high school didn't do too much of that, uh, but then for college, I went to a school that I knew had a really good marine science program because that's what I was interested in, and that's where I got a lot of my experience and opportunities moving forwards. So I think going to a school that gives you those opportunities is awesome, but even if you don't, you can still go outside on your own and gain those experiences too. All right, Liam. Do you have volunteers that stay out all night watching nests? Uh, we do not. Our volunteers will just go out in the morning. So we go super early. Um, we go like around sunrise to look for all new turtle activity and record nests and everything. Um, there are some groups down in Florida I know that go out at night time to try to tag turtles and um, get some DNA for them. But we don't do that here in South Carolina, at least not right now. Mina. Um, so in your slideshow, you talked a lot about turtles um, more than tortoises. Do you prefer turtles more than tortoises or do you just like working with turtles? Um, I really love turtles, but I do like tortoises too. When I was down in Florida, actually, sometimes we would see gopher tortoises that would crawl out on the beach as well. Um, I think tortoises are awesome. I just don't have as much experience with them and they are kind of separated in a way. So um, if you want a career in sea turtles, you don't focus too much on tortoises. I know there's some groups that do like sea turtles and terrapins together, like um, the Georgia Sea Turtle Center does that. Um, but occasionally we do run into tortoises, which are always cool. Hey, Grady. So, um, we were talking about some like positive effects from the coronavirus. Um, I was thinking like, what are some negative effects from the coronavirus? Yeah, so as far as turtles go, right now, we are not entirely sure if our sea turtle survey season will be on time. So if the CDC still has the beaches closed and we still have to social distance, um, we have not actually heard yet if be allowed to have permission or not. Fingers crossed. Hopefully we haven't heard one way or another, um, but that could possibly be an issue. And also right now, all of us, we can't go to our office, so we're all having to work from home, which also has its challenges. <laughs> well, um, Abby, we want to th thank you for today. Um, this was fabulous. And uh, you're sharing your time in the, the PowerPoint and the questions, and you're sharing your story of how you uh, discovered this in high school and how you've been so persistent, which is important for everyone to hear, especially in the midst of the coronavirus period where people can sort of get doomy and gloomy that just persistence pays off. Yeah. And I uh, want to thank uh, you and DNR and the TURTLE program and the 
uh, Explore Charleston, the Convention Visitor, Visitor Center Bureau, uh, for making this opportunity possible for our students and for the greater public. And we're crossing our fingers that everything will be good for you for Florida yeah. Atlantic this fall. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys so much. I love talking to you all. Um, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Hopefully everyone stays healthy out there and things go back to normal soon as well. Awesome. Well, good luck to you and um, good luck to everyone. Thank you all. We'll have some more classes tomorrow and um, see you all soon. Abby, many thanks. Please take care. Thanks so much. Bye guys. Bye everybody.